Welcome to the Cheating Wife Stories channel. Janet and I had been married for five years. We had met at university. Students were given a place in the halls of residence for the first year, but had to find their own accommodation for subsequent years. They are called halls but were more of a mini-village, with three or four students sharing a house. Whilst the individual houses were same-sex, the village was mixed. It quickly became party central, with the grassy area becoming an impromptu barbecue area. That is where I met Janet. I was studying veterinary science, obviously. She was doing business with French. We hit it off and went out together occasionally over the first year. But neither of us was ready to commit to each other. We didn't really see each other over the second year, except for bumping into each other in the students' union or some of the other bars and clubs. Her third year was a placement in Belgium. And it was only when she returned for her finals that we actually got together and started going steady. The relationship only lasted a year. Janet passed her finals and started looking for a job. I had another year to do. And quite frankly, I did not need any distractions. I eventually graduated with first-class honors and specialties in large and exotic animals. I was offered a number of positions and chose a practice on the periphery of town that provided services to farms and studs, as well as what we now call companion animals, pets, to normal people. Anyway, we ran into each other at a three-day event. She was running some sort of corporate event, and I was a guest of one of the owners who had a couple of horses in the competition. We arranged a date, and things developed from there. Janet was working for an international contracting company as an assistant to the regional sales director. Part of her duties was customer service. She organized promotional events for clients and potential clients. The job also involved some European travel. After about a year, I proposed, and she accepted. We were both 27. Life together had been pretty damn good up to this point. She was making good money, and I had established a good reputation, particularly with horses and zoo animals. We had bought a small rundown farmhouse with a couple of outbuildings and were doing it up with plans for an extension for when the kids arrived. The house was set in its own ground, surrounded by hedges and trees. It had been a farm, but the fields had been sold off to local farmers. The actual property had a very old agricultural caveat on the deeds, so you had to work in agriculture to live in it. The house didn't have enough ground to constitute a farm anymore, and it had lain unsold for quite a while. The lawyers decided that veterinary work was sufficiently agricultural, so we got a real bargain, a rural property with development potential at a price we couldn't have expected but for my job. Our income allowed us to travel as well. I had some Spanish from school, and in addition to fluent French, Janet had picked up some German and Italian. So we toured a lot of Europe. It had never occurred to me that Janet might be engaged in extramarital activities. I had some pretty wealthy lady clients whose husbands thought the horses were enough to keep their wives occupied, but I had been propositioned often enough to know that some married women were not as faithful to their vows as they might be. Nevertheless, I was not about to ruin the reputation of the practice that Henry, my partner, had invited me to join. I climbed the stairs quietly although the music from the bedroom covered my entrance. Pushing open the door, I fired once, hitting her lover in the rear. As he yelled and jumped clear of my cheating witch, I broke the gun, reloaded, and shot her too. Her lover recovered his composure and tried to charge at me, obviously intent on beating the heck out of me. His exertions only accelerated the inevitable. He started to tremble and fell to the floor. Janet looked at the dart in her side, and her eyes changed from shock to fear and finally dazed comprehension as the tranquilizer took effect. I wasn't stupid enough to use the same gun I used for putting down fallen beasts. I had used the dart gun for putting zoo animals to sleep so I could treat them. As they lay there, I went to the garage and got the roll of duct tape, returning to the bedroom to bind their wrists and ankles. I was about to stuff their underwear into their mouths but decided against it. Instead, I just taped them shut, then I carried them both downstairs and into the byre, still naked. The byre was an old stone building with thick walls, 
so it was stone cold no matter what the weather. It hadn't been cleaned out since it was last used for animals, and there were rings set into the wall to tie the beast to when milking or whatever. I tied them to two of them. Then I had an idea. My mother had looked after my elderly grandmother until she died. When mom died, I had cleared her house and stashed a lot of the stuff in one of the sheds. I still hadn't disposed of it. There were a lot of old surgical supplies the old woman had needed. Amongst these were some incontinence pants. I got two pairs, and releasing the restraints around my captive's legs, I put these on both of them. I take their legs again, returned to the house, and went through Julian's pockets. Then I used his keys and checked his car. So when they came to, they were sitting in dried-out animal dung, with their wrists tied to two of those rings, more or less naked and freezing cold. I was showered, dressed in clean clothes, sitting in a comfortable chair with a steaming cup of coffee and a nice warm pullover, my shotgun across my lap. My day's work was done. I ripped the tape from Janet's face. Just what the heck do you think you were playing at? She was trying bravado, but her mouth was dry, and her eyes told a different story. I held the coffee to her mouth, and she gulped at it. Too quickly, it burned all the way down. You scum sucker, she gasped, eventually. So tell me about it. About what? She blustered. How long has this been going on? How long has what been going on? I grabbed her by the hair and reapplied the tape. I'll leave you to think about things for a while. When I come back, you'd better be ready to tell me the truth. I had picked up a couple of really spicy curries on the way home. Releasing only one hand for each of them, I set the food in some water beside them, then gave them each a plastic spoon. Then I ripped the tape off their faces. They both grabbed the water and drained the cups. I took them and filled them from the outside tap. I listened outside the door but couldn't make out their whispered conversation. Not that it mattered. Their future was pretty much sealed. As a result, so was mine. I suppose I understand the looks I was getting from Willem and Janet at the last company deal. Took you long enough, sneered Julian. I turned the muzzles toward him. You really think I'm scared of that? You haven't the guts to shoot. He was wrong. Now, rock salt will barely penetrate the skin, normally. But if you are close enough, it will. I was close enough, and put both barrels into his calf. He squealed. It reminded me of asterisk deliverance, asterisk, but I was not going to be screwing him in the rear. Well, I might, but I decided if I was going to, I would use the double barrel. I reloaded. Dominic, I love you. I had to do it to keep my job. Julian was blackmailing me. You lying witch! Screamed Julian between gasps of pain. You've been screwing half the management to get where you are. Then to me, you better get me an ambulance. Get me one now, and I'll say nothing to the police. Yeah, right. I thought. I put the next two cartridges into his other calf and reloaded. You three hundred and four. I'll see you in jail for that. The next two went into his thigh. He squealed again but decided to say nothing. I taped his mouth. So who all were you going to screw in Brussels, then? It was an exhibition. It was work. So what was with the flight tickets to Barcelona? I didn't know he was taking me there. The clothes you packed say different. Look, obviously, you've been lying to me for God knows how long. And you haven't the respect to tell me the truth now. So you are going to pay for it. Seems to me you aren't expected back in the office this week. And you aren't expected in Brussels either. So I have all week to decide what to do with you. And nobody is going to report you missing. I taped her mouth again. They looked at one another. And I could see that they finally realized I had them in the palm of my hand. Just to reinforce that impression, I took the hose and soaked them. I hadn't expected it, but the water-soaked dung in which they were sitting started to give off a strong smell of urine and dung. I left them to contemplate the shortness of their future. I sat down with a cup of tea to decide how I was going to proceed. I had rather burn my bridges by shooting Julian in the legs. The temptation to kill the pair was strong. 
I was going to wind up in jail anyway for using the gun and false imprisonment, but I wasn't about to spend any more time locked up than necessary. In fact, I was going to avoid it as long as possible. There are plenty of missing people whose families are still looking for them and can't find them. Taking my video camera and gun, I went back to the buyer. The lovebirds were shivering like fury. Looking in their eyes, I saw that fear had set in. I set up the camera and took the tape off Julian's mouth. Janet's eyes were pleading now. I ignored her. My arms. Unty my arms, please, he begged. I need the toilet, please. Well, Julian, you've been messing around with my wife, and you expect me to be nice. I think you'll need to give me something if you want any consideration from me, don't you? Anything. His hopes were raised. He saw a way out. Take the car, or the boat. I'll sign them over to you. Just tell me what you want. I'll give you anything. I'd forgotten about his boat. It was a rather nice cabin cruiser. An idea was forming. Half the management, you said. I still wanted to mess with their minds, but I wanted to find out who else Janet had been involved with. If I was off the grid, I might get a chance at them too. What? You said she was messing around with half the management. I want names. I can't. I'll lose my job. So, you want to take their share of the punishment? I have all week to persuade you. You aren't due back till Saturday. No one is going to miss you till then. I poked his leg wound. He winced. Names. The toilet. I need the toilet. You have incontinence pants on. You'll get the toilet if and when I'm satisfied. What about Janet? She'll need it too. Who? Gallantry. I laughed. I'll make it clear, shall I? She's the one who betrayed me. You were collateral damage. I really don't give a darn about you. You know where messing with me got you. So far, you have all your limbs. You can still walk away from this, but if you go to the police, things will get worse for you. I might go to prison, but I'll get out. I sounded a lot more confident than I felt. Please, the cramps are killing me. I taked his mouth again. I'll let you think about it for a while more. I said, and made to leave. However, I untied their arms from the rings. They offered no resistance as I tied them behind their backs and laid them flat. Going back into the house, I started collecting things for my departure. Julian's offer of his boat gave me the germ of an idea. My parents had been on holiday in Ireland when I was born. Mum had gone into premature labor and it was touch and go whether I would survive. So they had registered my birth in Ireland. I had been re-registered when they brought me home, but I still had my Irish birth certificate. I gathered my personal documents, some clothes, and the euros Janet and Julian had drawn for their trip to Spain. I threw in my stamp collection. Tomorrow, I would go to the bank and get the special collection from the safety deposit box. The house was mortgaged to the hilt, we had put all our savings into the property, and it was heavily mortgaged. We needed both incomes to finance it. The idea had been that we stretch ourselves while we were young, and that pay raises and house price increases would take care of the future. Janet knew about the stamps, but thought it was a childish hobby and put no value on it. I knew differently. I slept fitfully and foamed in sick to the surgery the next morning. The lovers had clearly not slept anywhere near as well as I had. There was a different odor in the buyer. Clearly, the curry had finally done its work. I tied one of each of their hands to the rings and allowed them to eat a breakfast of bran flakes and wholemeal bread. I had added some laxative to the spread and to the tea. I was determined that they would sit in their own filth. Making it pass through their gut rapidly would mean that the stomach acids would not be properly neutralized. They were going to have the world's worst case of nappy rash. I just had to make sure it didn't turn into septicemia. Judging by the squirming they were doing, the skin on their nether regions was already stinging. Janet tried to talk to me. Please, James, let me go to the bathroom. I need to clean myself. I'm stinging. As far as I'm concerned, my darling wife, you can sit in your filth, and your cheating 304 can rot away. What you are getting is trench foot of the rear. Its technical name is immersion injury. 
The troops in the Falklands got it because they couldn't dry their feet. If it goes on too long, your skin will rot away. And the only way to fix it is to cut it away. Julian will lose his tool and balls, and you'll wind up having your cheating 304 cut out. You'll be using plastic pouches for the rest of your lives. My smile held no warmth. The shock on their faces showed I was getting into their heads. If you tell me what I want, soon enough, you might not have to rely on memory for your sex life. I wasn't entirely sure whether I was lying. I separated them this time. I put the ear defenders I use for shooting on Janet and taped them in place. Then I set up the camera. Okay, Julian, where are the keys for the boat? His face glowed with hope. On my key ring. The keys for my flat are there too. There's a safe in the wardrobe with ten grand in it. The key is on the ring too. Take the lot. Just let me get cleaned up, and I'll be out of your life. I won't go to the police, honestly. Don't you just love it when an arrogant scum sucker starts begging? I thought, but I filed the information for future reference. Where is the boat? The marina. Berth a 20. Right at the end of the jetty. Okay, I'll have a little think about it. While I'm thinking you are going to tell me and my little electronic friend here, I pointed to the camera, all about my cheating wife, who she's been screwing, and when and where. You are also going to tell me who you've been boasting to about her. And just so you know, she'll be doing the same shortly, so don't leave out anything. He started his confession. I was a little surprised to find it had been going on for about a year. I was also surprised to find it had been going on that long. I had braced myself to find she had been unfaithful for the entire duration of her time with the company, but hoped it was a recent thing. It started at the Dusseldorf Expo last year. On the last night, the management went out to dinner, and the guys were all going to a lap dancing club. I was going to get Janet and Bella Gardis from the Brussels office a taxi back to the hotel, but they said they wanted to see what the whole lap dancing thing was about. They got a little drunk, and Vim bought them a lap dance. They seemed embarrassed at first, but got into it. Then Janet said she could do better. It went downhill from there. She and Belle tried to dance, but the management wouldn't have it. They got a bit more drunk, and we headed back to the hotel. Vim had a suite, and Janet and Belle decided they would give us a dance because they had got us nearly thrown out of the club. I mean, come on. What would you do, James? They're both attractive. There's no way any of us were going to turn down a dance. He looked at me like a naughty puppy that knew it had done wrong. It was so pathetic I nearly laughed. Go on. Well, you know how it goes. No, actually. How does a wife start to cheat on her husband? Any sympathy evaporated. Well, they started stripping, and they got a bit competitive. Janet unzipped Jan's trousers and fished his tool out. Then she rubbed herself on him. She still had her knickers on, but Belle got Vim's out and sort of moved the crotch of her pants to the side and rubbed her fanny on him. Janet dropped her pants and started screwing January. It wound up that the six of us screwed the two of them. After that, we got together every time there was an exhibition. A girl from the French branch and the German office joined in six months ago. At least he had the decency to look ashamed. Names. Well, me, obviously. Jan Witters and Wim van der Kruisen from the Brussels office, Otto Visser from Dortmund, and Christoph Delmas from the Strasbourg branch. You said six. Julian wouldn't meet my eyes. Brian Uckwart, he mumbled. Uckwart was the UK manager of their company. He was an arrogant, thieving, dishonest scum sucker. He was also worth a fortune. When his wife found out he was playing away, she divorced him, but he used his money and contacts to leave the poor girl virtually destitute. He had seen to it that she was refused legal aid, and the solicitor she could afford was outgunned. I should have realized as soon as Julian said the whole thing started at an expo. That scum sucker never missed a freebie. Who were the women? Well, Belgardis Lishhouten, Amelie Fodrin, and Birgit Thun. They're all married too. I got him to run through as much as he could remember and recorded it all. 
It made me sick. Although the company executives had used the women, according to him, they had instigated events and were more than willing participants. Once he was finished, I had no stomach to listen to Janet's version. Nevertheless, I needed her version. I was vacillating between wreaking more vengeance on the two of them and releasing them, taking my chances that they would not go to the police. I took the camera into Janet. Now, I want the truth out of you. I have heard what Julian had to say. What happens to you both depends on what you tell me. Her tale was pretty much the same as Julian's, except she missed out the occasion when she was with Julian and Brian, screwing Uckwart when she was at home. It was just a bit of fun. Those things can be so boring. I just wanted something to do at night. It wasn't as if I was hurting you. You weren't missing out since I wasn't at home anyway, she pleaded. You really don't know much about the male of the species, do you? Those scum suckers were looking down their noses at the sucker whose wife was giving it away to anyone who wanted it, while I was keeping faith with a lying, cheating 304. Rage was growing again. They were really going to suffer for this. I had lost reason and was not thinking of consequences. But then I suppose she hadn't been either. You better have enjoyed it because your sex life is going to be memories from now on, honey. I dragged her back into Julian. Fury was burning in my gut. Please, James, please, let us get these things off and get cleaned up. My backside is sore. Let us get cleaned. We won't say anything to the police, begged Julian. I'm thirsty, pleaded Janet. Can I have some water? Just let us stand up and move about a bit, for God's sake. My muscles are aching. Now, I knew enough psychology to know they needed to have some hope and to see me as a potential benefactor if I was going to control them. I slit the tape on their legs but left their wrists bound. They needed help to get to their feet and both screamed as the blood flow returned. Gently, they flexed and bent to release the agony of their cramps and both tried to remove the plastic pants that were retaining the little chemical factory that was slowly digesting their flesh. Aha, I warned. For God's sake, James, if I get an infection, we'll never be able to have children, said Janet. I will be able to, probably just as well that you don't. I don't think your cheating genes should be passed on, darling. Her attempt to kick me would have been pathetic if it hadn't been so comical. She could barely move, and when she swung her legs, she lost balance, tumbling to the floor, unable to use her hands to save herself. For her trouble, all she got was a mouthful of dung. Julian tried to make for the door, but a gentle push was all that was needed to send him horizontal too. You really shouldn't have done that, I said as I dragged them back to their bonds. I was nice to you and let you stretch, and you got all violent with me. You said you wouldn't tell the police, and yet you tried to escape. I wonder where you thought you were going to go. Hmm. Seems I still can't trust you. You haven't learned your lesson, have you? I reapplied their gags, and just for badness, I turned the hose on them again. Leaving both of them sobbing, I went back to the house and formulated a plan. I had three or four days before they might be missed, and a couple more before any alarm bells would ring. Hell, given that their activities seemed little short of public knowledge, people might think they had run off together, although I couldn't really take that chance. I looked at what I had gathered together. There was enough to give me a start. I could go to Ireland, use my birth certificate to establish a new identity, and disappear. I figured the best way to fade from view was to use cash and public transport as much as possible. I would have to avoid stations and ports as much as possible. Britain is the CCTV camera center of the world. I fired up Julian's laptop and plotted a bus route to Holyhead. I figured it was the busier of the terminals and took me into Dublin. I could disappear into a bigger crowd and Dublin would have routes to more of Ireland than Rossler. I decided to start moving right away to allow the trail to go cold. I needed to make sure they wouldn't die before they were found. The rule of three says you can survive three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food. I returned to the buyer with water and allowed them to drink. I had laced it with a sedative. 
and once they were out, I set up a couple of intravenous giving sets with saline drips. Connecting all the bags of fluid into the drip control, I reckoned five liters should get them through the next few days and leave the incontinence pants soaked. To prevent infection, I dosed the drips with antibiotics. Okay, it was animal antibiotic. But I'm a vet. I just worked it out by body mass. I was tempted to wait till they came around from the sedative and have another little gloat, but I was pretty deep in the mess, so I resisted. Just before I left, I had another idea and added some sedative to the drips. It would keep them disoriented for a while longer. I removed the tape from their mouths so they wouldn't choke. Having checked their bonds, I locked the place up and loading my gear into his car, headed over to Julian's. If you look sufficiently confident, no one notices you. I simply walked up to his door, making sure he didn't have an alarm system, and used his key to enter. I found the safe, took the money, and left. I resisted the temptation to search for anything linked to my wife's betrayal. After all, I had his laptop and the video recording. I drove to a piece of derelict ground in a less than salubrious part of town that was used as a free car park. I left the keys on the tray of the center console and the door obviously improperly closed. Taking my rucksack and grip, I simply walked away. By the time I got to Ireland, the car would be stripped and the parts on their way to Saudi or the Balkans. Being right-hand drive, British prestige motors tend to be stripped for parts rather than sold complete. It is also easier to smuggle them out that way. Then I went to the marina and again, brazenly walked along the jetty, got onto the boat, fired up the engine, and cast off. I sailed around the coast a little until I found a little cove. I took the boat in and unloaded my rucksack. The grip containing my passport, part of my stamp collection, and about 5,000 pounds I left on board along with a couple of empty whiskey bottles. Then I plotted a course for Spain, pointed her south, and sent her on her way. She would sail till she ran out of fuel. I had no idea how far that would be. Hitching the pack onto my back, I headed inland to the bus, and using the planned route, I made my way to Holyhead. There, I bought a foot passenger return to Dublin. Arriving in Dublin, I decided I would take a walking holiday and explore the land of my birth. The first bus was heading to Kildare, so that is where I went. Three days into my extended holiday, I was sitting outside a pub overlooking the Atlantic. I noticed a mobile phone lying under a vacant table. I lifted it and found a cyber cafe where I did a search for the telephone number of what had been my local police force. I used the mobile to report people trying to break into a house and gave the address of my former home. The operator tried to keep me on the line and get more details, but I hung up. I wiped down the phone and dumped it in a litter bin. A month later, I decided to rent a place in Galway and started looking for a job. I had started calling myself Seamus O'Cleary, the Irish form of my name, James Clark. A lot of Irish people changed their names to the Gaelic form. It was not unusual and allowed me to use my birth certificate without any questions being asked. My walking tour had trimmed the fat off my belly, and I had allowed my hair and beard to grow. Since my beard was quite ginger, I changed my hair color too. I was determined to disappear. Having an address meant that I could apply for a passport and a driving license. I now had a complete, legal Irish identity with all new photographs. Having shed the weight, I decided to keep it off. I started running and found a gym. I chose Galway for a number of reasons, not least that it was a university town with a lot of high-tech industries, many of them pharmaceutical. If I couldn't get a veterinary job, I could get one with one of those. I applied for a number of jobs and got one with a company that did a lot of research in animal drugs. All I was really interested in was an income. I still had a decent bit of cash, but it was running out fast now I was paying rent. I had taken the opportunity to go through Julian's computer. There was quite a bit of information about Mekdi, the company they all worked for. There were profiles on Witters, van der Krusen, Visser, and Delmas. They were all regional directors. Janet was playing with the big boys. 
Julian was the British sales manager. I used a couple of internet cafes to research them, but couldn't get anything more than a few addresses. I couldn't be sure they were the right ones for the individuals concerned. All I could potentially use were the email addresses of the company. I found a file of passwords, but it was protected. I had little to do in the evening, so I spent some time trying all the usual simple codes, mother's maiden name, birth dates, and so on. No luck. Then I opened his pictures file. Amongst the photos was one labeled my first car. It clearly showed the number plate. I tried that. Lo and behold, the password file opened. Very kindly, he had labeled every password, including his bank account. I was tempted to empty it, but thought doing so might draw too much attention. What really provoked me, though, were the photos he had of a number of the parties they had held. Further probing revealed some video clips. At first, I didn't have the stomach to view all the photos and videos. After a few more weeks of anger and jealousy gnawing at my stomach, I decided the way to get revenge against the rest of the scum suckers was to use those photos and videos. I had to review them to select the, I suppose, best. I noticed in some of them Janet was smoking. I knew she didn't use tobacco, so I was guessing she had a habit I didn't know about either. First, though, I had to find out if I was a person of interest to the police. I hadn't attracted any interest from the Garda, and I was fairly confident that any search focusing on James Clark would not throw up Seamus O'Cleary. The nearest English pronunciation would be O'Cleary. Nevertheless, I decided a discreet search of the newspapers might be in order. I was getting rather paranoid about revealing my whereabouts. I didn't think that my attempts to conceal my movements were foolproof, but the longer I stayed free, the more I realized I could have another life. What I found just made things more complicated. I was dead. Am I dead? Well, anyway, I had been presumed dead after the boat had been found. The reports didn't say much about Janet and Julian, except that they had been found tied up after reports of a break-in and had required extensive medical treatment for their injuries. The report about the recovery of the boat appeared just two weeks ago, two months after I discovered my wife's infidelity. It had been recovered by some Spanish fishermen, who had claimed salvage rights to it. The report said that I had stolen the vessel and must have fallen overboard. It was linked to the incident at my house, suggesting that I had tried to disappear after faking the break-in and perished when the boat ran out of fuel. So I was free and clear to live as Seamus, but my plans to use the photos and videos might reveal that I was alive. I had intended to use the email address book from Mekday and send pictures to every member of staff in every branch. Spanish fishermen. That was it. I could speak Spanish. It was in the European Union, and there were direct flights from Cork or Dublin. I could go to Spain and send emails from there. I checked the airports. I could fly out on a Friday evening and return on Sunday. I wouldn't even have to take time off work. I flew out the following Friday. Paranoid as ever, I wore sunglasses and a Panama hat through the airports. I was not relying purely on my beard and hair. Arriving in Madrid, I went straight to the hotel and hit the sack. I had two laptops with me, mine and Julian's. First thing on Saturday, I went into town looking for an unsecured wireless link. It wasn't hard to find. More in hope than anger, I pulled Julian's computer from my backpack and fired it up. I was surprised when it connected. The second machine wasn't needed. I would have expected him to cancel his internet account. If he hadn't canceled that, maybe I could still access his intranet. I dug out the list of passwords, and I was in. That provided another little detour in the electronic trail. The address book was split into the separate national branches, so I sent different messages and attachments. There were, however, photographs of all the players sent to each branch. I had prepared the messages beforehand, so it didn't take long to send them. Once done, I took a stroll through Madrid in the late autumn sun. I resolved to do a bit more traveling once the dust had settled. I lunched on tapas and a fairly rough red wine before returning to my small backstreet hotel, chosen because it was less likely to have security cameras.
There I took the hard drive from Julian's computer and packed it away in case I came up with a future use for the data. I slept for a couple of hours and then went to the Parque Lineal del Rio Manzanares, a park along the river that runs through Madrid. I followed the river till I found a deep-looking area and threw the computer in before returning to the Plaza de Santa Barbara to sample the famous Madrid nightlife. By three in the morning, I had had enough. The town was still alive with revelers, but I was coming down from an adrenaline high. I returned to the hotel for a few hours' sleep before catching my plane home. For the next year, I worked for the pharmaceutical company. Galway is a lively town with a young population and the social life that goes along with it. I wasn't short of female company, but was reticent about commitment. Whilst I was content with the job, I still wanted to get back into veterinary practice, so I was on the lookout for a physician. One evening, while looking through the newspaper, I spotted an opportunity. A practice was up for sale. Next morning, I made an appointment to visit. It turned out that the principal, Dermot McCullough, was getting on in years, although he looked a good ten years younger than the seventy he claimed. Despite the fact that my accent had picked up a more Irish tone over the year, he picked me out immediately as English. He subtly gave me the third degree. I told him how I had been in practice in England, but my wife and I separated when she found the life of a country vet less exciting than she was prepared to accept. I told him that since I had no family, I had spent a few months traveling while I decided what to do and wound up in Galway, liked the place, and took the first job that came along while I found my feet again. He could tell there was more to it, but it was true enough that he saw the pain. He referred me to his accountant so I could look over the books, but I could already tell that it was a sound enough business that was right for growth. Basically, he was looking after his neighbor's animals and hadn't taken on any new business for years. To raise the money, I was going to have to sell my stamp collection. Now, when I say my collection, the core of it was really my grandfather's and father's. That is where the value lay. I took it to Sotheby's in Dublin. Initially, the appraiser thought it was just another fairly boring collection. He valued it at about 10,000 euros, which I thought was low. Then I showed him the part of the collection I had kept in the bank. May I ask where you got these? Some were collected by my grandfather, some by my father, and some by me. The British album contained examples of every British stamp up to the time I had left England. Amongst the collection was a set of two unseparated penny blacks that I had bought, another penny black, two penny reds, and two two penny blues, one perforated and one imperforate. The Empire album was not as complete but contained a full set of Falkland Island stamps. The European album was quite extensive and had a complete set from Nazi Germany. My grandfather had been stationed in Germany after World War II, and he had bought many collections from Germans who needed money to survive. These had formed the core of the collection. The albums I had left on the boat were virtually worthless modern stamps. I suppose the Spanish fishermen had kept them. Well, Mr. O'Clary, I think you should take these albums to our main philatelic department in London for valuation. There is a major auction in three months' time. So if you are of a mind to sell, it would be a good time to get them catalogued for sale. As it is, I would estimate a value of at least a quarter of a million euros. I'll do that then. Thank you. This posed a problem. If I was to buy the veterinary practice, I needed the money from the sale. It looked as if I couldn't get it for at least three months. I returned to Galway and paid another visit to Dermot. Mr. McCullough, I'm afraid I need to sell a stamp collection to raise the money to buy the practice. The auction won't be for about three months. Well, perhaps I can make a proposal to you. How about you work with me for those three months, and we can see how you get on with my clients. Then you can decide then whether you still want to buy. And so it was decided. Whilst I was fairly sure the police were not looking for me, I used Bus Eriand to get to London. I simply got on a bus, which took me to the ferry, and then another bus straight into London. Sotheby's agreed to catalogue the collection for sale and would notify me of how they would divide the lots, and I could make reserves based on their valuations. A month later, 
I was advised of an estimated value of half a million pounds sterling. Two months later, I was 900,000 pounds richer after commission and fees. During those three months, I had worked with Dermot and had established myself as a member of the community. The work was mainly with large animals and farm dogs. Dermot, however, also ran a small holding, raising beef and lamb, to augment his income. He intended that the farm was part of the sale, so I also learned to raise, buy, and sell animals. When the money from the sale of the stamps was transferred to my account, I paid Dermot for the business. He went into hard-earned retirement, and I became a part-time farmer and full-time vet. I worked hard at the practice and built up a strong client base. My reputation grew, and I found I was getting a lot of small animal work too. I opened a surgery in town, and soon I employed another vet, two veterinary nurses, and a receptionist. I was still able to have a social life. Despite Ireland being a Catholic country, there were a surprising number of women whose marriages had failed and were living separated lives. There were also a number of women who had never married, and I was never short of a companion. Then, one day, life, as she does, threw a curveball. I was in the surgery when in rushed Maureen O'Hara. Not the real one, of course, but a carbon copy. She had knocked down a dog and rushed into the office looking for help. I went out to her car and lifted the animal from the boot, blood leaking from both ends. I knew the poor beast was not going to make it. I also knew her owner, and more particularly her daughter, would be distraught. I x-rayed the dog. Too many broken ribs, a fractured skull, and a broken back meant she had to be put to sleep, there and then. I cleaned her up and laid her in a blanket, making her look as much as if she were asleep as I could. I loaded her into the back of my car and took her to her owner. All this time, Maureen O'Hara had waited. I don't think the dog's owners would be any more distraught. She insisted on coming with me. I knocked on the door. Mrs. Cadogan, I'm afraid Ferdy was knocked down. She was very badly injured, and I had to put her to sleep. Oh, Seamus, you didn't. Could you not have saved her? Mrs. Cadogan asked amidst the tears. I'm really sorry, Mrs. Cadogan. I really couldn't. The lady who hit her brought her straight to the surgery, but there was absolutely nothing I could do. Ferdy is in the car. I thought you would want to bury her yourself. Oh, yes, Oif oh, wouldn't want anything else. And the other thing is, the lady who hit Ferdy is with me. She is upset too and wanted to explain what happened. Oh, she wasn't able to avoid Ferdy. She ran out from between two cars. She has a dog of her own and wants you to know how sorry she is. If you don't want to see her, I'll bring Ferdy in so you don't have to meet her. If she brought Ferdy to you and wanted to speak to me, she must be a good person. I'll speak to her. Mrs. Cadogan accompanied me to the car, and my passenger got out. Mrs. Cadogan, this is... Oh, I'm afraid I don't know your name. Nyav Gallagher. Mrs. Cadogan, I'm so sorry. I just couldn't avoid Ferdy, Nayef explained. If there is any damage to your car, let me know, and I'll get it fixed. Oh, I couldn't do that. I want to get another dog for you, if you'll let me. I'll just take Ferdy inside, I said. Her bed is in the kitchen. If you would just put her in that, I'll explain to Oif when she comes home from school. I left the women talking and arranged Ferdy in her basket. Returning to the car, I explained that I would have to get back to the surgery. Mrs. Gallagher, by now I had noticed the rings on her finger, got back in, and we returned to the office. How much do I owe you? Forget it. I wouldn't charge for that. At least let me buy you dinner then. Should a married woman be seen buying me dinner? I doubt very much if my husband would care even if I knew where he was. Well, in that case, I gave her my card. Phone me. That Friday, Nyam phoned. Dinner was booked in Galway for Saturday evening. I dressed in my best and met her at the restaurant. Over dinner, I discovered that she or her husband had left her. She didn't go into details, and I didn't press her. I told her that I had caught my wife with another man and left her. Neither of us was divorced. After dinner, we went to a club 
and danced a little, parting at midnight. I felt that I wanted to get to know her better, but now I had to face the stark reality of my situation. I was still married, even if I was presumed dead. I felt I wanted to develop a relationship with Naya. If I was going to do so, I would have to resolve my past. Hell, I was getting ahead of myself. Maybe she wasn't interested. She phoned me the following Thursday. I decided if you weren't going to phone me, I would have to phone you. I don't have your number. Oh, I didn't think. Shall I pick you up tomorrow evening? That would be nice. Around eight. Fine. Where? She gave me her address. I picked her up, and we went dancing again. When I dropped her off, I arranged to pick her up again on Sunday afternoon. We went to the beach and strolled along the sand, just getting to know one another. This set the pattern for the next few months. Then, one Friday, my offer of dinner was turned down. I'll make dinner tonight, she said. Over the meal, she asked why I was moving so slowly. We're both grown-ups. We've both been married. It's just complicated. Neither of us is free. We're both still technically married. So you're saying you see this as a long-term relationship? Well, I suppose I am. And if we were both divorced? Well, there's the thing. I can never be divorced. Why ever not? You're English, aren't you? Divorce is straightforward in England. I stood up. Look, it really is very complicated. I need to think some things through before we take this any further. I'd better go. I'll phone you. I didn't phone that weekend. I did some solitary walking over the building, trying to work out what I would tell her. The darkness of my actions had come back to haunt me. I was still a prisoner of my wife's infidelity. I needed to find out what had happened to Janet. To do that, I risked going to prison. I phoned Nayam on Monday morning before she went to work and arranged to see her that night. I arrived at her door at eight. We sat in her lounge. Would you like a drink? Tea would be good. I procrastinated. Well, Seamus, there was nothing for it. If I wanted to move on, I had to bury the ghosts. I told her the truth. Well, some of it. I came home, found my wife screwing her boss, threatened them with a gun, dragged them out to the barn, tied them up, stole her lover's money, car, and boat, engineered my disappearance, and adopted a new identity. Oh my God, how have you been able to carry that with you for so long? I'm going to need time to understand how I feel about all this, Seamus. I think you had better go. I need time. I left. Part of me felt better for the confession. Part of me felt it was time to run again. Why the heck had I told her so much? What made me think I could trust her? Two days later, she was on my doorstep. Well, aren't you going to invite me in? Sorry. Come in. Drink. Coffee, please. We sat on either side of the kitchen table. I think you need to resolve your issues if we are going to have a chance to take things further, Seamus. I know, Naya. I just don't know how to deal with the mess I've made. Well, I think I have a solution. My uncle Brendan has a legal practice in Liverpool. I think you should talk with him. I don't see how he can help. Uncle Brendan does a lot of work tracing kids who run away to England. He uses investigators all over England. He might be able to trace your wife and find out where you stand with the police. It's worth a try. I suppose so. Good. He'll be here tomorrow. Do you fish? Eh, I have done. Right. He likes to fish the Shannon. It should let you tell him your story. He might be able to tell you what he can do. Well, young man, have you a hundred euros on you? Yeah. Give. He held out his hand, and I counted the money out. Right, you have hired me, so everything is covered by legal privilege. Tell me everything, including the bits you didn't tell Maya. So I did, including the Spanish trip. Jesus, boyo, you dug yourself a hole. Right, I'll go back and do a bit of investigating. It won't be cheap, but it will be worth it. Naya and I were still going out to dinner and dancing, but we had an unspoken agreement that we were slowing things until we had some news from Uncle Brendan. Six weeks after our conversation, 
he arrived back in Galway and called into the surgery. Can you take some time off, Seamus? Yes, sure. I arranged with Aidin, the receptionist, to get Declan to cover. Shall we head up to the farm? Sounds good. We took our coffee into the sitting room, and Brendan gave me the report. That is a comprehensive account of what happened to your wife after you left. It is the only copy there is. Read it thoroughly and phone me tomorrow evening. I'm staying with Naya, but I'll be fishing during the day. He finished his coffee, we shook hands, and he left. I weighed the report in my hand, anxious to know what it said, afraid of what it might mean. The police had responded to my phone call to find Janet and Julian squirming in agony. They called an ambulance, and the lovers were treated for severe emergent injury compounded by the action of diarrhea. They hadn't suffered lasting damage, but it took some time for their skin to heal. Neither Julian nor Janet made a complaint, which meant the police hadn't laid charges. The emails to their company, on the other hand, had set the cat among the pigeons. An American company was in negotiations with McDay to buy them out. One of the email addresses I had sent the photos to happened to be a member of the buyout team. When they got it, the Americans started to get cold feet. European employers were not as concerned about the private lives of their employees as U.S. companies. There is not the same precedent for claims against businesses for sexual misconduct by staff. Nevertheless, they were wary of an action being brought in the courts in their country. The Europeans investigated the culprits and promptly terminated their employment. Uckwart was furious and blamed Julian and Janet. When he lost his job, Julian's wife, Natalie, threw him out of the house. With nowhere to go, he moved into my house with Janet. While clearing his possessions, Natalie found some drugs. These she handed in to the police who arrested and charged him. This led the police to search my house, where they found more. Inquiries of the Spanish police revealed that they had also found drugs on his boat. He claimed that he was holding them for book court and claimed that they used the boat to smuggle drugs from the continent, but only for their personal use. Unfortunately for them, the quantities were sufficient for charges of dealing to be laid. The link with a major regional employer had given the local journalists a chance to make a bit of a name for themselves, so they had covered it in more depth than the nationals. The police investigated the European connection, and Witters, van der Kruisen, Visser, and Delmas were hauled in by their respective police agencies. Investigations led to charges of sex and drug trafficking linked to Eastern Europe, with sentences ranging from 10 to 15 years. Uckward turned out to be an even nastier piece of work than I had realized. He had Janet and Julian abducted. They were taken to an unoccupied warehouse, but fortunately for them, the police had it under surveillance and immediately called in reinforcements to raid the premises. The police weren't quite quick enough to save Julian from a severe beating, but Janet had only received a broken nose and cheekbone when she was rescued. Uckward, Julian, and Janet were tried on a variety of charges. Julian went down for ten years on the drugs charges. Uckward got a twenty stretch and had his property and bank accounts seized by the Assets Recovery Branch of the Serious Organized Crime Agency. Janet got off with a suspended sentence. She tried to get me declared officially dead, using the newspaper reports I had seen to back the claim so she could sell the house and claim my life insurance. The case dragged on, and the loss adjusters disputed the claim. Eventually, the bank foreclosed on the mortgage, and she lost the house. With no income, she couldn't pursue the case and wound up working in Tesco as a shelf stacker and checkout girl. There she met a widower who managed to date her, eventually proposing. With all the newspaper coverage, the only way for her to grab him, and doubtless more importantly, his money, was to get rid of me. The upshot of that was that Janet divorced me for abandonment. I was a free agent. Next morning, I phoned Naya and arranged to meet her for lunch. I was waiting for her. Her face was a mix of anticipation and anxiety. Well, your uncle gave me this. I handed her the report. I want you to read it before we make any decisions. Are you sure? As sure as I am of anything. If you and I are to have any sort of future, 
I need you to know the truth. I've lived under a shadow for too long. I want to be able to walk in the sun with you. No secrets. I'll take this home. I'll phone you later. I spent the afternoon on tenterhooks. The call came at seven. Seamus, can you come to the house? Uncle Brendan is here. We can think about what we do now. I was in the car in a flash. Seated on the patio, I toyed with my coffee anxiously. Brendan spoke. As I see it, you cannot marry. My heart sank. Until that moment, I don't think I realized how much I loved and wanted to marry Nayam for at least 18 months. What? I was thoroughly confused. Nayam cannot get divorced for another 18 months. I thought you couldn't get divorced in Ireland. You are behind the times, Seamus, or do you prefer James? Divorce has been available in Ireland for nearly 10 years. Nayam and her husband have been separated for two and a half years, but the law requires that they have been apart for four years. You can't get married until then. That explained a lot. I looked at Nayam. What do you say? We have 18 months to wait. I haven't asked you to marry me. You will, she smiled. Nayam doesn't know about the conversation Brendan and I had the day after she told me I would ask her to marry. He wanted to make sure I wouldn't harm his only niece. I assured him I had grown and that I had no intention of putting myself in such a position ever again. I may not have been in jail, but I wasn't free. He gave me that freedom, and I am never going to sacrifice that freedom again. We married two years later. I am still known as Seamus. It is much easier than explaining to all my new friends and clients. Naya and I live on the farm, but now I rent out the land. The freedom to travel and see the world with such a beautiful partner is too precious to tie myself to property. And she doesn't want me leaving our bed at dawn. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.